I'm Max Saran, and I'm an instructor at SAS Polytech in Regina, Saskatchewan. I teach welding, steel fab, and innovative manufacturing. I've been there about five years, and welcome to my show. Uh, this week, we're going to be discussing a little bit more about metallurgy. Uh, the first episode, we kind of broke down where metallurgy starts in terms of ore to iron. Today, we're going to be taking that a little bit further and getting from the iron to steel. All right, so... Uh, we're going to be following right through on terms of the processes about how you make the steel, the various types of processes, and then why we do that and uh, and then what we do with it. All right. So I guess like all the shows, we're going to start with a simple question of why. All right. So why do we need to know about the production of steel? Well, really what it comes down to when we talk about the production of steel, it's about um, what we're going to do with it. Okay, so what's the purpose of the product that we're buying? It's really important to note that when we're uh, ordering steel, there's a ton of variations. There's different types of steel and there's new types of steels being invented every day. There's alloys that are being uh, created for specific purposes. And then there's the generic steels that really aren't so generic once you get down to it. What you want to know as a steel worker is what I'm doing with steel and what's it going to be for and its service and its cost, right? And aside from that, so there's also the factor that sometimes we just don't care, right? And that's actually a big part of steel is um, the steels that we don't need to worry that much about. And how do we keep those costs low? And then how do we make those products? Okay. So in terms of the why, it's for purpose. What are we going to do with the steel? All right. Now we turn about the how, okay? So when we start discussing about the how, if you've taken any courses in uh, any college or any school or even checked out things online, they're gonna talk about the production of steel and they're always gonna break it down into three kind of main areas, okay? So you're gonna have your basic oxygen furnace, basic O2, you're gonna have your electric arc, and then you're gonna have your open hearth. Okay, so when you're looking at these types of steel producing methods, you're going to have to keep in mind there's a few things that, that play big parts in them. So first of all, I would say is location. So we, we talked about ore and digging ore out of the ground and making iron out of that, or pig iron, which is the final product. Well, in order to do that, you need ore. So ore is actually a non-renewable resource that we're pulling out of the ground and uh, there's not going to be more of it coming out of the ground. So it's actually getting harder and harder to deal with making steel out of pig iron that comes from ore. So the chain starts to get a little bit complicated, all right? Now, in terms of the ores that are existing in the planet, they, they are not necessarily the greatest quality. They can sometimes be more of the limonite or the types of ores that have a lot of oxygen or water content, which means they need to be refined even further. That makes it tougher as well. Now, the last part of uh, steel making that makes it very important for location is the access to scrap iron or scrap steel, okay? Having access to scrap is huge because what happens is that we make iron and we've been making iron and steel products for well, almost thousands of years now. And that iron and steel product that we have can, for the large part, be recycled. But in the recycling process or in the reusing process, we're going to encounter the same issues that we always have, which are carbon content and oxygen. Okay, we're going to come up to that. Now, when I look at these three types of furnaces, let's start with the oldest, most basic style, which is the open hearth. So the open hearth is very simple. If I had to draw a picture, it'd be like this. There's a little ladle here. I fill it with iron, pig iron, some alloys, additives. Uh, I have a refractory liner, which sometimes can be brick. And I basically am shooting heat back and forth. Uh, there'll be a better slide because I'm not the greatest drawer. But basically what this does is it creates a small batch of one-off purpose-built steel. So I take my ore, I take my additives, I take my alloys, I add in some things, and then I'm basically just heating this up in an oven. Okay, when we talk about refractory, we're going to come across that lot when we come to TIG, when we come to certain types of metals. It's going to come up again when we get to basic oxygen. Refractory is a very simple concept that sometimes people get confused. I'll break it down real quick right now so you guys understand. Here's me, here's a mirror, and there, if I look in that mirror, I see myself, okay? That's a reflection. Now, what's a refraction? 
Now, if I have a mirror and over here is a table and I have a flower, there's my pretty flower, I look in here and I see my flower. That is a refraction, okay? Like water on the highway on a hot day. It's not real water. You're seeing the sky above. That's refracted light. So reflection and refraction, refraction are close, but not the same. So in this instance, what's refractory means? Well, refractory means that it's keeping it in. It's like insulating. So that heat can't escape, it bounces back in, okay? Now that's important for a lot of materials. Diamonds use refractory index. Tungsten is a refractory metal. Bricks are a refractory metal because they insulate and, and contain, all right? Certain types of ceramics and porcelains are as well, like the porcelain on your spark plug, okay? It doesn't absorb the heat, it reflects it back or refracts it back. So an open hearth is a refractory process where I trap the heat inside, I'm able to melt this pot, then I can pour it out and make my ingot. Okay, now this is probably the simplest, oldest school way of doing it, but it's also the least economical. A lot of heat, a lot of gas, a lot of waste product, and then you can only do a small batch at a time. Now it does have a purpose, okay? Now that purpose is that it can do specialty steals, you can do one-offs, or you can do special custom orders. That's okay, but you're not making a lot of money on it unless you're charging a lot of money for it, all right? Now the second one we're gonna look at is your basic oxygen furnace. Now this type of furnace is the kind of, looks a lot like the blast one you see, except now I have a lamps here and I have a, an output and a gas off. What's happening in the basic oxygen furnace is number one, basic, what's it referring to? Well, basic means that it has a basic refractory liner. Again, refractory, we're keeping heat in. Then I'm heating this thing up and I have my elements in here. I have my ore, I have my alloys, I have my additives, my deoxidizers, my stabilizers, whatever I'm putting in. And then I'm gonna blast this thing with pressurized oxygen, all right? Now that pressurized oxygen is gonna go in there, ramp those heats up, churn everything up, and speed this whole process up like crazy. It's just gonna go mad in there. Now that's good, it's quick, but more importantly, it's continuous, all right? As this comes out, I can bleed out or tap out the bottom and fill up an ingot, all right? And I can keep charging in, and then I can take off the, the, the froth that comes off all the slag and the byproduct and the waste and peel it off the top. And I can just keep going and going and going. You'll see terms called continuous casting or continuous rolling or roll slab or hot slab rolling. All these terms are referring to a system where I can keep tapping and going, tapping and going. Now this is the most productive way to make steel. Now the, the negative thing about a basic oxygen furnace is that once you're going, you don't want to stop. So this is a set type of steel. You're looking at making a large run of material. So you're looking at, say, making structural steel. I'm going to be making thousands of kilometers of I-beam or thousands of kilometers of piping. And I'm just going to have the same mix run through. I'm going to be testing it, making sure it's the same, you know, level of deoxidizing or ingot style. And I'm going to be making sure that it's the same amount of carbon that I want throughout the whole mill test report so that that steel goes out and certified to a to a quality that can be assured. Changing over is tough. If I want to change over, I got to replace, I got to clean out, I got to change dyes, I got to change materials, I got to change processes, and then I can run a high carbon steel run. Okay, so this is high production, low changeover. We got lots of changeover, low production. Both of these, this one and this one, can run off uh, or, or ground scrap. Okay, now ground scrap means like uh, they, they call them a, a cyclone mixer and they have one here in Regina because we have a steel mill here in Regina. And what that does is it grinds metal down, basically a big blender, and it grinds metal down to little chips. All right, so you need small chips in order to, to allow this thing to heat up because even though both of them work and they're a high heat process, the heating takes time, right? It takes time and you've got natural gas to heat these. These generally run off la large, high pressure natural gas systems that take time to heat. And as heat goes into here, as the steel comes out, the heat vacates with it. So you're losing heat constantly. So you gotta be replacing that heat. So you're gonna be losing a lot of energy. All right, now, the smaller the chips, the more crushed up the ore, the easier that energy is to replace. Fallen? Now this third style is the kind we have here in my hometown of Regina. Okay, Evraz steel mill. It's an electric arc furnace. 
Now, the electric arc furnace is basically a big electric pot with a lid, and it's got these big carbon style, or generally here, they're uh, a hollow tubed copper lance, okay? And basically, they're cooled. They have water cooling going through them so that they don't stick to the pot. They fill this with material. These rods come down, and with electricity, it just blasts it with energy. And that creates a lot of heat very quickly, all right? Now, this style is one of the most economical styles that you can use. It uses just electricity, which you can get from any power plant to hydro, whatever. So it's a much more um, reasonable to use in uh, remote areas or in places that have uh, less access to natural gas or natural gases that get expensive because natural gas is a fixed price based on the economy, whereas electricity is less fixed because it can come from various sources. All right, now pluses and minuses. The plus of the electric arc furnace is that you can do one-offs very quickly. They have a fast changeover range. Boom, boom, boom. These things come in, they fire off the oxygen lances in a sequence, it melts it, and it actually creates a natural mixing process where they rotate. And as it rotates, the lighter materials float to the top, heavier materials to the bottom, and then they team it out the bottom or pull the ink or the steel out the bottom, and they can they can pull material. Okay? Now, I can do lots of different types of steels in here very quickly. Second positive, very useful with scrap. Scrap does not barely have to be ground down at all. You can throw it in there. Like, I mean, I've seen like bicycles and engine blocks in there. They literally just throw it in as long as the lid can go on. You, you heat up a small amount first to just to get the charge kind of floating. And then, boom, you hit it with the electricity and it makes that pot melt right now. It's also, like I said, mixes well. Now, what's the negative? Well, one of the negatives about it is that they are kind of one-offs. So I can do a huge pot, boom, boom, boom. It's quick, pour it out, next one, boom, boom, boom. But there's still a change over time. Now, with modern technology and sciences, electrical processes, cooling systems, and continuous casting slab technology, like the plant here in town, they can make a pot, charge it up, make the metal, and get it rolling. And before that coil's even done being rolled out, they already got the next one ready to go. So it's almost nonstop. All right, almost nonstop. So these are kind of the three ways we can make steel and kind of why we have them. Now in terms of ore, this one is almost not ore specific at all. You can use any type of scrap. Well, I mean, not any, but like you gotta know what you have going in there, obviously for the mix. But this one is the most reasonable or the easiest to use with scrap materials. Now, most electric arc furnaces are in centralized locations that have lots of access to scrap. They're usually geographically specific. You want to put an electric arc furnace, you want to build that steel plant somewhere that has access to rail or water. Uh, so in Canada, you're looking at centralized locations like Regina here, where we have rail coming from all sides of the country from the U.S. where we can make steel. Or in Hamilton, where they have electric arc furnaces, where they uh, have access to waterways because you want to have access to steel. All right. Now, in terms of the quality, they're all good. They're all good. And in terms of coating, they are noted. You can order steel from an electric arc furnace specifically. You can order steel from a basic oxygen furnace specifically or an open hearth if you want. Okay, so that's part of, like we said, the producing of the steel. What do I want? Okay, so we've made our steel and or we know how to make our steel, I should say. And we have a, kind of the system started. Now, what do we do with that? Well, we have to start worrying about the next step. Now, when we talk about steel or welding or anything to do with steel trades, we always kind of get back to the same point, And that is carbon versus oxygen. Okay. Why do I want one and not the other? Okay. So, um, or how much of each do I want? Okay. Because it's, it's generally like we don't want oxygen. Well, that's not always true. And we sometimes say, well, we don't want carbon or we want lots of carbon. Well, that's a, that's a huge story in itself. All right, so let's break this down. We got O2 and we got, C and we got carbon. Okay, so let's, let's put these verses. All right, so we got, we got the fight set up. Okay, so I'm ordering my steel. Let's start with carbon. Okay, we're going to start with this guy, this atom right here. What are we going to do with that? Okay, well, pig iron we talked about that we get. It's three to four percent, okay? Three to four percent carbon. And I said earlier that that's way too high, way too high. And when I talk about being way too high, it's like, well, what's that? Doesn't seem like a very high number. 
Well, when we're going to get a little bit more into this, you're going to see why. But that's like incredibly hard steel. And you're thinking, well, hard steel is good steel. Well, not so much. One of the best things about steel is its ability to be malleable, formed, and ductile. Okay, so that means I can hammer it, I can bend it, I can form it, and then it keeps its shape. So I can even bend it a little bit and it comes back. That's what's called its yield or elastic limit. Okay, how far can I bend it and it comes back? And if I have a spring, well, I can stretch it out and burn it comes back. That's awesome, right? I don't want to have things just bend and it's broken. Now, sometimes I do want things that are incredibly hard, like say my vice, my table vice. I want that to be hard. I'm going to hammer things on it. I'm going to uh, use a file and I need to, you know, uh, file things and wear them down as an abrasive or a saw a saw blade needs to have sharp teeth that are harder than the material that they're cutting or else it won't cut through it now those all have varying levels of tempering and and carbon to them but if you get too high in the carbon level your options for tempering go down and your likeliness of cracking to saturation of carbon or graphite goes up all right so let's talk about that. We got a long line, or this is just carbon. We got a long line here, and we got 0% carbon, and let's put this at that 4%. It could be whatever, but 4 is high enough. Now, when we talk about steel, generally we talk about steel anywhere from here to that 1.7% or 1.8 or 2%, whatever number they give you in a textbook, it's really not that specific. It's when a certain thing happens, and that's when carbon starts to get too uh, saturated. But at this point, we, these are all types of steel. And here we get into cast iron. Okay. So what's the distinctions here? What's the difference between a steel and a cast iron? Well, here at zero, we have a nice soft and ductile. Okay. That means I can hammer it. I can bend it. I can form it. But it's not going to keep its shape that well because it's soft. And just like I can bend it one way, well, I can bend back. And there's a thing called work hardening, which is another topic where if I bend it and bend it back, bend it, bend it back, we've done this with wires. You just do this to a wire, so nearly it'll break, right? That's also a, not a great thing. You want things to have a certain level of hardness. We talk about that 0.3%, this being low carbon. We talk about up to 0.6%, medium carbon, and then 6 up to 1.7 being high carbon. What are these? Low carbon, where most of our stuff lives. Okay, most of the steel we deal with is going to be around that 0 0.3, 0 0.2, somewhere in there, uh, carbon steel, which means that it's got some hardness to it, and it's uh, able to still be formed and bent, heated, tempered, quenched. All these things can happen in a safe environment where you're not going to have too much grain migration or saturation. Okay, uh, once we get to the 0.3 to 0.6, we're getting into that medium carbon. So we're talking about a harder metal. We're talking about maybe some higher end structural steels, we're looking at high, uh, harder formed materials, case coverings, things like that. We get up to the 0.6 to 1.7s, we're talking about hardened steels, we're talking about files, bearing races, springs, saw blades, razors, stuff like that. Okay, so that's the spectrum. And at this point up, we turn into cast iron. From here to here, these are all versions of carbon. Okay, so I'm going to draw this out to you guys so hopefully it makes sense. Now, first of all, in the low carbon, we're going to talk about something called a lattice. All right, now the lattice is basically just a 2D version of me explaining atomic structure. It doesn't have to get too heavy. I can get real heavy. If you're taking class or if you're working towards your journey persons in, uh, in welding or steel fab, you're going to get heavy. But for now, let's keep it light. This is a 2D version, and each one of these blocks represents an iron. Okay, so I'm just going to put F, but it's really FE I'm talking about. So here's all my Fs. Now that's 0%. There's no carbons in there. Each one of these bonds is magnetically holding on to each other. Okay, there's atoms and electrons and neutrons, and the spinning and the motion creates a natural energy that exists within that atom. That energy wants to attract a likewise energy. It's called the law of attraction. It's a physical precept of life. Like attracts like. Okay, we, there's no escaping this. It's a law of physics. So irons are going to attract irons. And they're going to form a tight bond. They're going to meet each other. And they're going to meet in a nice crystalline structure. Because steel is a crystal. Okay? Just like weird crystals that grow in, in caves. Alright? It's still a crystal. That crystal will want to arrange itself in a specific way. 
even if we're rolling it and we're making I-beams or C-channels or angulars or whatever the hell it is you're making, it still arranges itself in a specific way on its own. We don't want to mess with that too much because messing with that changes the structure, changes how it reacts to heat. So it's called thermal conductivity or, uh, or electrical conductivity uh, or electrical resistivity if you want to look at it from the other angle. Okay. Now, as we add carbon, what happens? Okay. Right now, if I look at an individual Fe, I got four bonds. Okay. See that? So I got four bonds and they're playing nice. And each one of these guys is holding on to each other on the four sides. Now we're just talking 2D. Technically, there's what? Six sides to a cube, whatever. We'll deal with this just so you understand. Now I'm going to add a carbon. There's my carbon. He's a little bit different shape because all atomic particles have a different shape, different number of electrons, different uh, type of bonding surfaces, different shape of crystal. Okay. So he's going to sit there in the middle. What happened? Well, if I zoom in on that, you can see that that's that part of that carbon that's there. So now I have one, two, three, four bonds and a fifth where it connects to that. So in this area, I've created an extra set of bonds to those iron atoms. And those extra set of bonds allow the steel to be stronger. It's got more bonds per square atom that make that structure stronger. Now that is a good thing at this point, okay? In the low carbon setup, I will have a few carbons here and there that are changing the atomic structure enough to create stronger and better bonds to increase the hardness of the material, all right? Now, as we go up, things start getting a little different. And in this medium carbon world, I'm gonna say now have a few more, okay? Now this is again, still fine. Here's my extra bonds. And now my medium carbon is getting harder and harder. Now this is getting harder to work with in terms of producing and also uh, drawing or, or forming or extruding or whatever you're doing with it. Now this material is also going to be more subjective to tempering or other steel processes that have to do with heat because steel and carbon are different materials. They have different heating points. They have different melting points. They have different burning points, which is very critical. I can heat this up and I can mess with the carbon in not a positive way. The carbons will get loose. And guess what? Remember the law of attraction, carbons and carbons. If I get things too hot and these carbons are tend to be a little bit closer to each other, they're going to want to pull towards each other. Okay. That's called grain migration. Things want to get to hang out with their buddies. Homies love homies, right? So that's what happens. Now at this point, it's not really an issue. Medium carbon steel, we can start getting some of the issues of migration versus temperature, which would be things like martensite, all right? We get to high carbon, and now I look at my lattice, and I'm just about full, okay? So I got lots of carbons in here. Now high carbon steel, you gotta be careful with, because it's very susceptible to migration or tempering problems like like uh, like martensite. I heat this up and these will, they'll float through, they'll force their ways and they'll join. But if I roll this out properly, create it properly in a nice environment, I can make a good quality high carbon steel, like a drill bit or something like that. Now, if you guys have ever worked with high carbon steel, you know that heat is the enemy. For example, if you guys are ever tapping a hole and you break the tap in a hole and I'm tapping into soft, nice mild steel, which is low carbon steel. If that tap breaks in there, how do you get it out? Well, you can't drill out a drill, that's really tough. Or you can hole saw around it, or you can try to burn it out with the torch. All these things work, but they're kind of a mess. Let me tell you the easiest way to get a tap out of a hole. Heat it up with a torch so it's red and pour some water on it. You'll hear that crystalline structure smash out. It'll go ting, 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 crunch, crunch, crunch. You do that, and you've created a full piece of martensitic steel because all the carbons are gonna have migrated together and formed groups. Now you just take a chisel and a hammer and smash it. It'll explode into a million pieces and you won't even wreck the thread. Okay. That's what you can do with high carbon steel. Now, obviously high carbon steel has a purpose and it's good hard steel, but you got to know what that purpose is and you got to know what you're going to do with it. Now at this point, this spectrum 
everything we have here is still carbon, 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 Fe, Fe, Fe. Now, what changes once we get past 1.7? Well, let me tell you what changes. What starts to happen is we were talking about how like attracts like. So if I start getting too many carbons together in a close vicinity, they start to want to bond with each other, and they will. And what you get is a carbon party. Now, a carbon party is not just a carbon party. Like I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of fun, but it changes the name. A carbon party is called graphite. Okay? Graphite is an accumulation of bonded carbon. Okay, so as you can see, the carbons are getting closer to closer per square, whatever, space. Now, when I get to cast iron, I've saturated this piece. So what I have now is clusters of graphite living within the steel. And what it does is it'll, it'll actually vacate certain areas. I'll have certain areas where there's no carbons at all. Because the carbons are not evenly spaced now. The carbons have attracted to each other into an area to create graphite and left other areas open. So you're going to have varying degrees of hardness throughout cast iron, which makes it very hard to work with in terms of heating, forming, welding, repairing, drilling. All these things are tough to do because you've got hard pockets of graphite and soft parts of metal. Heat doesn't travel well through it either. Because heat's not going to travel evenly through materials of different com composition. Now remember, carbon's a very, very interesting element. In small amounts, it lives singularly as a carbon, a burnable atom. We use it. We have carbon in our body. It makes us, you know, alive. We can burn carbon in coal and in charcoal and in oil and petroleum. But we start to put it together, and then we get graphite. Graphite we can is now a rock. It's a harder substance. I can use that for writing. It's in pencils. I can also use it for conducting electricity, like as in a carbon arc gouging rod, which is mainly graphite, all right? And I can press it even more and get it the carbons even tighter and more together in a high heat environment, and I end up with diamonds, right? We got our diamonds here. Shine like a diamond, man. So this diamond is the same composition as that graphite, except just clustered and compressed. And this is the hardest element on the planet. Now, we're adding that element in varying degrees to our steel, right? Hardness goes up, just like hardness goes up. You see what's happening? Now, if I crack or if I weld any of these metals, weld them in properly, when I break that piece open, my, here's my weld, and then I weld it, and then I grind it, and then I bend it, and then it cracks, right? I'm going to see sometimes little shiny pockets in there. Looks like little pieces of glass. Well, guess what you've done? You welded that improperly or in a different manner or you didn't follow one of the procedures properly and you actually migrated carbon into clusters and you've weakened that steel. You took good steel and you made bad steel out of it by doing something wrong. Now, that's a big deal. As you go up this, that gets easier to do. And when you get to here, well, that's really hard to do in terms of welding. Okay, welding cast iron is a very tricky thing. You gotta grind, you gotta preheat, post heat, interpass temperature, drilling out ends, crack migration. You may have to butter it with other alloys, pre, post, during. There's a lot of things to do to make cast iron usable. Within cast iron, there's also various types. We got white, we got gray, we got nodular, and then we got malleable, right? I mean, my writing's terrible, but you guys can look it up. But what I'm saying is that within these four types of cast, all what we're doing in this cast world is mitigating that graphite. What are we doing with it? Why is that important? Well, let me tell you. Graphite is a crystal, all right? So just like all crystals, they tend to grow in fingers, like a snowflake, right? A drop of water, you freeze it, turns into a snowflake. A drop of carbon, you freeze it, or graphite, you freeze it, turns into a crystal. These fingers that come out are called dendrites. Dendrite. Dendrite. There we go. And dendrites are just a natural formation of a crystal. So then when this exists inside of my structure of steel, 
those fingers actually create lots of bonding surfaces. Adds to the hardness. But they're also very disruptive in, form, in terms of bending. Imagine trying to bend this piece of wood over a, a round ball, right? It would be hard to do. Now I bend that piece of wood over a sharp corner and snap, right? Same thing here. I got sharp corners. I got, these are all uh, subject to micro fractures. That's the term, okay? So these micro fractures are issues for cast iron, especially white cast, which means that I've made cast and quenched it and that forces dendrites to, right? It's like taking a, a glass of water and throwing it out in minus 30. It goes boom, crystal right now. Well, that's what happens when I quench gray cast iron, which is a, your base cast. I create extra dendrites. It freezes them super fast. And then that makes it super brittle, but crazy hard, okay? Basically not weldable, by the way. If you break white cast, uh, break out the JV weld. Now, the other two, nodular and modular, basically what I'm trying to do is mitigate these corners. So I take my cast iron, I heat it back up, try to kind of break off, right? Those corners kind of get melted back in. And now I've created a somewhat more workable friendly heat friendly type of cast iron okay so when I, when you're talking about cast irons what am i using them for transmissions housings uh hard uh, table vices uh machining equipment things that need to not move like say uh, an exhaust manifold on your car the exhaust manifold bolts onto a surface that is machined right and i don't want things to move so until recently, in the last 20, 30 years, where we came up with lots of new crazy alloys that are really hard and, and good with heat, in, initially, anything under a high heat wear situation would have to be cast iron. Because while all other steels are expanding and shrinking and you know just destroying uh, oil seals and rings and, and machine surfaces, cast iron won't move. It will not move. It'll stay rigid. Now that's good. But you hit it with a hammer, it'll smash. For example... Years ago, I went out on a job where I had to change out hundreds of bearings. Like I'm talking, it was like a conveyor that was like two kilometers long. And it was hundreds of bearings that had to get changed out because they were all the races were worn out. And this is old. Like we don't even, we don't even build conveyors up anymore. There's an old uh, potash plant that had this long service line that was like way old. Okay, so we got changes out. I went out there and all these bolts are frozen. They're all rusted and it's all garbage. And they handed me an oxy fuel torch and I went out there and I was trying to, cut these heads off these bolts and then hammer them off okay i was doing this it was going pretty slow uh, an older older guy out there came up to me with a bigger hammer he said what are you doing you're wasting your time these are all cast iron bearing blocks and i said okay and and he said just smash them and i was like really and he said yeah so i just took a hammer bam and it, psh, they just exploded and i just walked by bam 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 and they just exploded off of there now cast iron is not good with getting smashed it doesn't like it so that's a big drawback of cast iron. So from soft to crazy hard, all based on carbon, okay? Now what's the next element we're gonna talk about? Well, the next element that we're gonna have to talk about is oxygen. And oxygen also has a ratio in terms of when I make the steel, all right? Now it's important to know that because a 0% or a 100%, now I'm not talking about 0% oxygen, 100% oxygen. I'm talking about how it's deoxidized. Okay, when I'm producing steel, I'm going to want to order something that's fully deoxidized or not deoxidized at all or very low. Okay, so if I say 0%, I'm saying that it's not deoxidized, which means it has as much oxygen as it's willing to hold in the steel making process. Now, I'm not saying it's fully oxygenated. I'm just saying that some oxygen may have gone in there and no one's watching it too close. But why, why would anyone do that? Well, let me tell you, most of the steel that we order is in the lower range of, of deoxidized use. Okay? Now, this steel is called rimmed. And like all steel that has access to oxygen in the melting or forming process, it will draw it in. So if I have an ingot it will have oxygen pockets in it, gas pockets, and kind of all over. And like You're going to look at that and be like, why would anyone want this steel? Well, let me tell you why people want this steel. Cha-ching, it's cheap. 
Okay, now that's a good thing for a lot of things. You're like, why? why? How is that good? Well, let me tell you, how much does a coat hanger cost you, right? How much did that microphone stand that I'm using over here cost me? I would say if you stop and look around your house or outside or your vehicle or anything that has steel, a large portion of the things around you are made out of really cheap steel because even cheap steel is very strong. So why would I invest money as a producer of a product in buying quality steel when I'm making a low quality part? And I'm not saying low quality like it's junk. I'm saying low quality in terms of its use. Remember, we always have to think about where is this steel going, okay? So coat hangers is a great example. If I had it just the cheapest, cheapest steel, then I can make coat hangers. But I don't want pig iron because that's too much carbon. So I would want a rimmed steel with a low carbon content because it still needs to get formed into a coat hanger shape and then spun with a little pop in the hook. If it's too hard and they go to bend, it's going to snap, right? And if it's too soft and I hang my clothes on it, it's going to it's going to droop and that's no good either. We've all had coat hangers that are like that. The steel's too soft, but if it's too hard, it breaks. So the company is deciding, do I make this harder and have to throw out 10% because they broke? Or do I make it softer and then the customer is just mad because my pants make it droop? Well, that's something a producer has to decide. But they're not using expensive steel for that. They're using cheap steel. And toys, Hot Wheels cars. Like, I mean, no one cares. Lots of stuff about the world is in this area. Okay, we go to the fully deoxidized. I don't and I'm, I put 100%-ish, okay, ish there, approximate. Why? Well, because you can never get anything to 100%. That's just the way you have it. That's just life. It's very hard to make things 100%. Now, this is killed. Okay, we call that killed steel, K-I-L-L-E-D. Now, killed steel will be almost perfect. There's going to be a little bit of a crater because just like when you run a bead, you finish at the end, and that little piece you finish at the end, it's not going to have any deoxidizers. It's going to have a little bit of oxygen get in there, and you're going to have a natural crater. But most of the steel here is going to be certifiably clean. Certifiably. That's important to know. Because if I'm buying killed steel, I'm paying big bucks, right? I'm paying big cha-chings over here for really high-end steel. Now, why would I ever need that? Well, that's also important to know. There's very few things on the planet that require fully killed steel. One of them that we use all the time in welding world is our electro consumables. So our TIG wire, our MIG wire, our stick electrode core, all of these are going to be killed steel because they need to be certified. They're going into a certified environment. They're in a procedure. They need to be the same every time. Okay. So I'm going to want my core to be as clean and as perfect as possible every time now if i need to add or take things away in the process that's fine that's fine i can add that or take it away in the flux or the gas or the process okay but i want the core to be the same so 7018 is a 7018 no matter what if you're in canada 4918 is a 4918 no matter what okay it's the same every time and i can put a csa a cwb stamp or an iso or an aws stamp on that and it's going to be guaranteed all right, now that's important. Very few things need that level of, of perfection, okay? Now everything else we call semi-killed, semi-killed, okay? And that's just a ratio, and that is 100% based on what you want to do with it. So I'm going to order steel, and I'm going to say, yo, man, I want a 0.3 carbon steel that is 10% deoxidized. Yeah, I can make that for you. Or I can go to the catalog of steel produced by a producer from an electric arc furnace mill, and they will have our products. This product is 0.3 to 0.33 carbon, and it's 10 to 12% deoxidized, and it's already in the lot. Does this work for you? Yes. I can engineer something around those specifications. That's generally how you want to do things. Getting something custom ordered is expensive. And at this point, most levels of steel are pretty figured out for structural versus whatever, okay? So look at what's available, order what fits within your parameters, and engineer to that. Trust me, nothing is worse as a welder or a steel fabricator when you're on a job and an engineer sends in a print and they want you to have a three and a quarter by a five and a half at three quarter inch thick angle iron. That doesn't exist. 
I got to order this from somebody now? Where? Like, come on, see what's available, what's common, what fits your parameters, and engineer your products or your materials to that. That's a smart way of doing it. Save you a bunch of time. Okay? All right. So we got our carbon and our oxygen figured out. We got why we need to do that in terms of hardness, durability, malleability, bendability, heatability, temperability, all the abilities, right? We got that figured out. We're trying to work with that. Now, the next steps is in terms of casting, rolling, uh, extruding, and forming of the materials and what that does to it. And that's going to be the next episode. All right. So we went over a lot of stuff today. I hope you liked it. Uh, ask Max at cwbgroup.org. Send me an email if you got any questions. If you want me to add something, if you got something that I'd like to do a show on, let me know. I can do blurps. I, I got my studio set up now, and I'm hoping you guys are enjoying this. I really hope this is something that's helpful to you guys. I want to thank SAS Polytech, especially where I work in Regina. We got an awesome team. We got awesome equipment. It's a great program. I hope I get you guys in my seats to teach you either welding steel fab or our new innovative manufacturing program, which is the bee's knees. It's absolutely awesome. Okay. I want to thank CWB Acorn for handing me the slides and the artwork and having a team that works on this with me. Thank you guys. You guys do a great job. I want to thank CWB Education for offering free courses right now to online. Get on there. Lots of free courses offered during this uh, crisis time. You know, get out there and get some free education while you're at it. And then lastly, I want to thank my network, my local network, which is the Regina Association, the Regina Chapter. These are tough times, uh, and you know what? We're still communicating. We're still talking. The networking that is important for the welding industry is huge, and I can't stress that. I work all over the world. I've been all over the place on awesome jobs, on awesome projects, and I would say a large portion of that has less to do with my ability, but more to do with my networking and getting out there and working with people as a team. All right, so let's team up. Let's get some cool stuff going, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much.